of faithless and perverse generation. Can he say? Faithless and what else? What makes a man get perverted with our faith? What's perverted our Christianity? Faithless. Don't say that profess that God has given you the power, love, and a sound mind, and your mind is not sound. And you don't have power to overcome your present situation and circumstances. Now, the devil is always pushing. You can recognize the demons working because they always push to impetuous, immediate action. Don't think, do. And the devil says, if you don't do it now, you'll miss the opportunity. If you don't move now, if you don't sell now, if you don't jump now, it'll be gone. And the kingdom of God is best expressed by authority and power to cast out devils. Ah, uh, listen, dear friends. Don't forget that little word he said, seek ye first. Come on, that's the secret right there, seek ye first. Seek ye first. Oh, I tell you, the average person said, seek me first. That's it, seek me first. Put me first. Well, anyone who opposes the kingdom of God and the casting out of devils, because when we're of God's kingdom, our sole purpose is to destroy Satan's kingdom. Our sole purpose is to cast down Satan's kingdom. I can tell you whether you're one soul or not, whether you get your prayers answered, whether you're happy or not, whether you got a happy home or not, whether you were killing in the church or not. I can tell you, if you love your prayers and let me see how you start your day out, if you grab a cup of coffee and a newspaper and sit down for an hour and let the Bible go back and go there, you're mixed up in world. The Word of God said we're going over to the other side. And in the midst of the word of God said, we are going over to the other side. The enemy showed up in the storm. And the first thing that the enemy did was challenge those who are walk with Christ. Those who eat with him and slept with him and saw the miracle, the signs and the wonders done by him. The first thing that did, the enemy did was steal the word that they heard right out of their heart and then allowed doubt to rise up. On the inside of them, and instead of believing what the Word of God says, they said, Lord, we perish. Reading the Word that's going to give you faith, that isn't what he's talking about. It isn't just hearing the Word that's going to give you faith. You've got to open your spiritual ear or eye as you hear or read the Word and appropriate by faith. Make it yours. That'll sober you up. That ought to melt your silly heart. I'm not interested in your feelings and your little silly sentimentality. I'm wondering about your love for Christ and compassion. Brothers, do you care? I'm asking you one question tonight. Do you love Jesus or do you love this stinking world? But God wants us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Deceiving ourselves. How many folks are deceived every single week? Going to hear what they call the word and it never once emboldens them or give them a desire or a passion to do the works of Christ. We want just a bunch of sickly sentimentality and we want to just fix up sort of a hiding place and a loophole for sinners to say, well, if that old cuss made it in, I can make it in myself. The kingdom is within you and the only kingdom that this world is going to understand un. Till the king comes is what they see in us. Because now we are the only creatures that have the ability to walk in darkness and to walk in light. Oh, God, people, God! Shalom, 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 Israel. Blessings to y'all. This is Elder Becker tonight bringing you this edition of Blog Talk Radio. I am truly blessed and thankful to be able to present this teaching to you. I sure hope you enjoy it. Unfortunately, Saints, this is another pre-recorded broadcast. And, and due to um, certain circumstances that I just find this the better avenue currently for presenting you these studies. Um, so... I hope you bear with me, and I'll try to keep it at a pace where, uh, once again, Brother Ugly can post the information, the scriptures, the 
definitions for you all as he, as he faithfully does, and I do thank him for that. Anyway, without much further ado, tonight's study, and it's going to be more than tonight because it, it's turning out to be a lot longer than I thought it was going to be, is the mystery behind the 24 elders of Revelation. And what I mean by that, if you ever speak to the pre-tribulation rapture theorists, those that um, contend that Jesus comes back twice for the saints, once before the beginning of the Great Tribulation, one at the end of the Great Tribulation, they use a great deal in their challenge and in their stance on this belief of the 24 elders in Revelation, and more particularly, why or how it comes to be that when John was given the Revelation, he saw these 24 elders, how is it that they were before the throne of the Lamb, and how is it that they were there before the seals, the trumpets, and the vials were unloosed onto this earth? Now, that's the question, that's the contention, that, that's one of their stronger points that they've used. And, you know, honestly, the fact is, as I was challenged by this particular doctor sometimes back, I was speaking to somebody that I grew up with when I was back in Minnesota for a visit, and he holds to this doctrine about the pre-tribulation rapture, and obviously it was something that it, he had been taught in the Christian realm, in the Christian circles, and... It's something that he's held to, something that he can identify with. And as as, as I was challenging his different points, he, he, he presented me something that I had never heard of coming from these pre-tribulation rapture people is that the, the, the occasion with the 24 elders and how they came to be there when as yet the events that are described to take place in the Great Tribulation had not yet taken place. And I really couldn't provide him a, a good answer. And, and and for some years now, I really never, well, I never really thought on it too much to actually put some time into thinking about it. But here lately, I have been thinking about it, and I think it's a, a viable question or more or less we provide a, a concrete answer because this is something that if, if we can get it etched down in stone that uh, the course of which they believe the way perceived might be actually the thing that helps to undo or, or helps to unblock this particular doctrine that is these people hold dear and hold fast so with that being said let's let's get started of course we're going to be spending a great deal of time in the book of revelation so I hope you enjoy this study. I really do. Now let me say this quick before I get started, though. The uh, reference to the 24 elders can only be found in the book of Revelations, and it's me mentioned in six separate occasions. So that's the only place you're going to find the mention of the 24 elders. So Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and then verses 10 and 11. All right, starting at the first verse. And after this I looked and beheld, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee these things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in the sight like unto an emerald. And of course we know that was the Lamb, the Messiah, Jesus, sitting on his throne. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting in, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So we got a description here that John gives us in Revelation 4.4 4 of twenty and four elders, which he saw sitting on twenty-four seats. Now the word seats here is the Greek 2362, and it means a stately seat, a throne, by implication, power, or concretely a potentate, seat throne. So basically what we have is John is also seeing these 24 elders sitting on 24 thrones. All right, continuing on, verse 5. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunders and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire before burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of Yah. 
And of course, now we're back describing the throne that the Lamb is sitting on. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of the eyes before and behind. Okay, Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. And the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Yah, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So we have a demonstration of the worship coming from the four and twenty elders. Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Revelation 5, verses 1 through 10. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So we have a description here for the Messiah, Jesus, the Lamb, holding a book. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open to read the book, neither to look thereon. And the answer to that is quite simple, is because nobody on this earth that ever walked as earth was without sin except the Messiah. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of Yah sent forth into all the earth. So here we have again the um, we have not only the elders, the 24 elders, but we also have four beasts standing in the midst of the throne. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and, the, and, and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps. So now we're getting a picture. Another description from John, every one of them having harps and golden vials full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to Yah by the blood out of every where, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto Yah kings and priests. We shall reign on the earth. Revelation chapter 11, verses 16 through 18. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before Yah on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped Yah, saying, We give thee thanks, O Yah, Elohim Almighty, which art and was and art to come, describing Jesus, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that, shall, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. All right, out of all these accounts, um, there's, uh, there's quite a few attributes and characteristics that are um, directly tied to these 20 and 4 elders. And that is going to be probably the, the biggest the biggest area which we're going to cover in this study is these actual attributes to help define who these elders were. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to give you what these attributes, these characteristics of these 24 elders were. Number one, they are elders. Okay, simple enough. Number two, they are clothed in white raiment. Number three, they have crowns on their heads. Number four, they sit on 24 seats or thrones around the throne of the Lamb. Number five, they are joined by four beasts. Number six, they all carry harps. Number seven, they all carry golden vials full of the incense, which is the prayers of the saints. Number eight, they have been redeemed out of every kindred, nation, tongue, peoples, and nations. Number nine, they were made kings and priests to Yah. Number ten, they will rule, reign and rule on this earth 
and not in the heavenlies. And number 11, they proclaim Yah's greatness in the time of his wrath, judgment, and reward to his prophets and his saints. Now, using this information which we have available to us, we are going to examine each attribute, and hopefully this will bring us to help solving the mystery of who the 24 elders are. All right, uh, we have the word elder in the Hebrews 2205, which is pronounced Zakane. It's from 2204. And here in this instance, this description means old, aged, an ancient man, an elder, old man, men, and women, a senator. All right, and it, it was said from 2204, Hebrew 2204, in the, in, the, in the Hebrew lexicon, and it is pronounced the same way, and it means a primitive root to be old, aged man, be wax, old, an old man. All right, another instance that we find the word elder in the Hebrew lexicon or in, in the usage of the Old Testament writings is Hebrew number 7227, Rab, R-A-B, and it's only used one time in this instance, in, in, in this description. By contraction from uh, Hebrew 7231 means abundant in quantity, size, age, number, rank, quality, uh, in abound, abundance, and it means captain, elder, enough, exceedingly full, greatly, increased long, and so on and so forth. You can see the rest of the description there. And unfortunately, I wish I would have had it in front of here, the one instance that um, this particular word elder is used in, and like I said, it's only used once. And on the next broadcast, if I remember, I'll, I'll go ahead and give that to you. Or you can look it up for yourself. That's Hebrews 72:27. All right, then we have the word elder in the Greek lexicon, the Greek 42:45, presbyteros, as in presbytery, where we get the word presbytery. Comparative of presbys, which means elderly, older as a noun, a senior, specifically an Israelite Sanhedrist also figure to the member of the Celestial Council or Christian Presbyter. You know, they got a lot of stuff thrown in here that is just wrong. You know, and I have a note here. I have a little reference note that I usually write when I'm doing my um, studies so I can bring them to my mind as, as I record these or speak them to you. But my note says, it is highly doubtful that the implication suggested here is meant to reference 24 members of the Sanhedrin for the 24 elders. For they were of the number which spoke most defiantly, let the blood of this man, meaning Jesus Christ, be upon us and upon our children. This is Matthew 27, 25. That's upon his crucifixion. So they were out there just shouting, and I highly doubt. And of course, you're dealing with not only the people that were there, but more specifically those that were of the number shouting this, um, of the scribes and Pharisees who hold the Talmud most dear. When the word elders viewed from the meanings given in the Old Testament, it generally means men that are aged and men that held the duty as officers amongst the people. Numbers chapter 11 verse 16 so we're going to go over the word elder, number one in this list of 11 attributes and characteristics surrounding the uh, 24 elders in the book of Revelation. Numbers 11, 16. And Yahweh said unto Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with me. So Moses is declaring something he wants. He's given a command. He wants the 70. He gives a number, 70 elders of Israel. So far by the definition, these would mean that the, they're the aged men. The word officer in this particular instance. See, I, I, I use this particular verse because it said not only elders of the people, but also officers over them, giving the distinction of their duties over the people of Israel. 
The word officer in the Hebrew lexicon is 7860. It's pronounced shoter. It means an active participle of an otherwise unused root, probably meaning to write, properly ascribe, that is, by analogy or implication, an official superintendent or magistrate, officer, overseer, or ruler. And quickly, this is, I'm doing another study. I've got about five or six of them going on right at this current time, so I kind of jump around all the time. But in this other particular study, I'm listing all the offices and all the titles that are mentioned in the Old the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and actually comparing them to some of the words, the titles and usages that we find in the New Testament. And just to let the cat out of the bag, the word officer here is the same, using the same context as the word bishop is in the New Testament. And what what's strange about that is why they just didn't continue to use the word officer, but they they saw that they had a need in the Greek to change it to bishop. But they both mean superintendent, uh, ruler, and overseer in that capacity. Anyway, continuing on, the word elder is often tagged to those which were chosen amongst the people of Israel to help Moses shoulder the huge task and heavy burden of making judgments between the people. However, it is more likely that the elders may have assisted in a consolatory role alongside the judges which were handpicked by Moses and the elders in a joint effort. If it was the case that these particular passages, and we're going to get to these passages in Exodus, were suggesting that those to be chosen were those 70 elders who had already enjoyed an elevated position in Israel, then why go through all the hassle of handpicking those men which met the qualifications described by Jethro when they were already available and operating in such capacity in Israel. According to what was written, one of the qualifications of the men that were to be judges amongst the people was not that they met a certain age requirement, already indicating that those to be selected were not necessarily of the 70 elders of Israel. I hope that wasn't too confusing. I was reading my handwritten, or my hand, my typed um, paragraph here. Exodus chapter 18, verses 19 through 23. And I'm not going to read you, of course, the whole chapter, but uh, m many of you are familiar with it. In fact, most are familiar with it, that uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, uh, is visiting with uh, Moses and, and the children of Israel, and he sees all these people you know, from morning till evening coming before Moses to get some judgment about certain matters. So he, he gives some counsel, and that's where we're going to start. Verse 19, Hearken now unto my voice, now I give thee counsel, and Yah shall be with thee. Be thou for the people, Yah, word, that thou mayest bring thy, the causes unto Yah. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, moreover, excuse me, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, it's given a list of characteristics, qualifications for these men, such as fear Yah, men of truth, hate and covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and Yah command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So we can see by this account, again, as I mentioned earlier, that Jethro and, uh, had given Moses counsel about to appoint men. The point being that there isn't mentioned once in these any of these qualifications that men that were had to be aged. So is it necessarily those that were considered elders or aged men in Israel out you know out, of the seventy that were spoken of already? I don't know. I, I don't doubt that the seventy elders possess such qualifications. However, then, the term elder that we're using is the one provided for us in the Greek language and that not of the Hebrew, meaning that it's the one where the word elder we're looking at constraining is one in, the, in, in Revelation. 
The word elder occurs 67 times in the renewed covenant, and of these 67 mentions, only one time does it speak of any other title than elder. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, it translates old men, further giving more credence that the word elder in both the Old and New Testaments mean men that are of a greater age. The New Testament also agrees with the old when it holds the fact that the elders are also held as officers, rulers, overseers, and those which have the responsibility of teaching the people of Israel. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Timothy 5, 17. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Let the elders who rule be counted worthy of double respect, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. So here we have Paul writing and saying, let the elders who rule or have a position of rulership or, or position to oversee the saints of the Most High. Let them be counted worthy of double respect, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Plead the flock of Yah which is among you. So Peter's admonishing the elders, Peter also being an elder, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not mean because you're forced to, because you want to, but willingly not for filthy lucre's sake, or for money, or for payment, or for gain, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over Yah's heritage, but being examples to the flock. Now one could argue the point of what age one has to be in order to be considered that of, an, of, that of eldership. The Apostle Peter counted himself as an elder amongst Israel, and the indications that we have from the Gospels is that Peter was a younger man. John chapter 21, verses 17 and 18. John 21, verses 17 and 18. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, this is Jesus speaking to Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yahweh, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, here's Jesus indicating the past, when Peter was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, meaning that Peter hasn't reached the age yet where he was considered old, that thou shalt stretch forth thy hand, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. Whatever the case, the 24 elders of the book of Revelation and lining up with those things written in the Bible were men who were probably older. They no doubt had positions within the body of Christ and that of the nation of Israel as leaders, as overseers, as rulers, and as judges. Now the next aspect we will examine is that all of these 24 elders were clothed in white garments. All right, the word white in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew lexicon, is the Hebrew 948, which is pronounced boots, or spelled B-U-T-S. In this particular instance of the word white is found, it's going to be used as we're going to read in Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 12. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And it means from an unused root of the same form, meaning to bleach, that is, intransitively, be white, probably cotton of some sort, fine, white linen. All right, in the Greek, white, number 3022, mucos. And that means a light or white or white. And it, it's really important to remember that it means a light also because that lines up with some of the verses we're going to read out of the Gospels. All right, Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 and 8 speaking about how the elders that are mentioned in the book of Revelation were dressed in uh, white raiment. Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife had made herself ready. And to her, that is to the wife, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, 
And this gives a description of the linen, of the, the clean and white linen. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So here we have a pretty good description of what the white raiment, the white linen represents. Now, in this particular case, the word linen is used more to describe the type of fabric that John was able to relate to in his description, not so much the clothing being raiment, or as we're going to find out, roll, but again, more or less the, the kind of fabric it was. Revelation chapter 3, verses 3, Revelation 3, excuse me, verses 4 and 5. Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Here's an attribute of those that get the white raiment, those that overcome. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Revelation 3, verse 18 I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. Another instance of white raiment. The word raiment is the Greek 2440. Um, you all have to take a stab at spelling or pronouncing it, so himatian. Is that close enough? I hope so. It's uh, It means to put on a dress, inner or outer, apparel, cloak, clothes, garment, raiment, robe, vesture. covers a whole gamut of what type of clo different clothing there it might represent. All right, Second Chronicles chapter 5, 11 through 14. As I said earlier, this one instance in the Old Testament speaking about white, it was only in this instance that I used this because it was appropriate and applicable. Second Chronicles 5, 11 through 14. And it came to pass when the priest would come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified, did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, and all of them of Asaph, of Heman, of Judathon, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalteries and harps, stood on the east end of the altar, and with them an hundred and twenty priests sounding with the trumpets. And it came to pass, as the trumpeters and singers were one, to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking Yahweh. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the master saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Then that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of Yahweh, so that the priest could not stand and minister by the reason of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh had filled the house of Yah. And remarkably, what is amazing about these few verses here is it gives a really good description of what the elders were doing many in the many instances in the book of Revelation. Um, and it does tell us in Revelation uh, 5, I believe it was, that they had harps in their hand. And they also were arrayed in white raiment or white linen. But in this particular instance, it's pointing back to the Levites, who were priests. And, of course, the elders were considered to be kings and priests. You see the connection there? Hmm, something to think about. Well, of course, we're going to dig into this a little bit deeper. Revelation chapter 7, 9 through, as I scroll down here, 14, 9 through 14. And after this I beheld and lo a great multitude which no man can number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to Yah which sit upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped Yah. So we have all these people, including the 24 elders and the four beasts, before the throne, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our Yah forever and ever. Amen. Verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And here we have, in Revelation 7.13, one of the elders 
had said unto John, asked him a question. He said, what are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? So we know that the elders can speak, and they definitely speak to John. And this is the answer. And, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here's another description of those that were worthy to wear the white raiment. They came out of great tribulation. They were overcomers, and they were worthy to wear, to, uh, wear the white raiment. Robes. Uh, the Greek 47:49 for the for the word robes, as we see it in used in this context, is from the Greek 47:24, and it means equipment that is specifically a stole or long-fitting gown as a mark of dignity, long clothing, garment, long robe, and that relates earlier to the description I gave, and I have to go back up here and look at it again of raiment, where it also um, describes a robe. All right, moving on, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 and 3. All given descriptions of instances where there's a connection between those that wear these white robes or white raiment. Verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of Yah descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. Again, to give him a description of the heavenly clothing that the, be, that the host from heaven wear, that's described as white as snow. Mark chapter 16, verses 2. All the way to verse 5, verses 2 to verse 5. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came to the sepulcher at the rising of the sun, and they said on among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side. Isn't that remarkable? They actually could identify this angelic being is looking young, or a young man, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. John chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And see the two angels in white. <clears throat> excuse me. And see the two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 and 2. Just quickly going over some instances in the Bible where it talks about those that have wear white garments, white raiment, white robes, white clothing, um, and what the significance behind these white garments are. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. So now we have a case where the Messiah, Jesus, is on the earth, and they're up on the mount, and all of a sudden there's this transfiguration. And in the Greek, that's 33, 39. It means metamorpho, which, as we know today, is the term metamorphosis or change. It's from the Greek 3326 and 3445. It means to transform literally or figuratively metamorphous. Change, transfigure, transform. So Jesus all of a sudden was transformed into that of a spiritual being. He took on the nature of uh, what it would mean to be in the heavenlies. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. And after six days, Jesus taketh them Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Of course, again, meaning trained, uh, changed or transformed. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. So, the context, though, the the important thing to understand about this is that the description here 
is only deals with the, the clothing that Jesus was wearing. I mean, he had to come from corruption and put on incorruption to enter into a spiritual realm. And the same with the 24 elders. They're wearing white garments, mean that they've overcome, means that they've transformed or transfigured from that of corruption to incorruption. Based on the aforementioned scriptures and Bible verses, those which were given the honor and the right to be dressed in white clothing were those who, those who were of the Levite singers, as we read earlier in Second Chronicles, the angelic host of the heavens and those that were to abide or are currently abiding in the heavenlies which had overcome the nature of the flesh and rewarded with garments of white to demonstrate that they were righteous and victorious. Incidentally, the only mention of anyone clothed in white clothing in the Old Testament was the Levite priest, which we read about in Second Chronicles um, chapter 5, verse 12. The next attribute of the 24 elders that we will examine is that they all wore crowns of gold upon their heads. Most often in the pages of the Old Testament, the word crown, as it was used to denote someone of authority and position in ears, or whether it appertained to a high priest or a king. The bulk of the word crown, as is written in the Old Testament, relies on two definitions provided by two forms of usage. All right, in the Hebrew, we're going to examine the Hebrew meaning of the word crown, and then we'll, we'll take a look at the Greek word. Okay, as we find in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant writings, uh, crown, Hebrews 22.13 in, in the Hebrew lexicon, zare, zar, uh, if I believe that's how it's pronounced, Z-A-R-E. It's from Hebrews 22:37 in the sense of scattering. It's a chaplet as spread around the top. That is specifically a border molding crown. And this word chaplet, as you're going to find out as we read these different definitions, is going to keep showing up. And it, it, I guess the reason it keeps getting inserted into these definitions is because it gives you a pretty good idea context of what a crown really represents. And the other word crown that we're going to use in the Old Testament, some of the scriptures in there, is Hebrews 51.45. It's pronounced nazir. And it's from Hebrews 51.44. It means properly something set apart that is abstractly dedication of a priest or a Nazarite, hence consecrately unshorn locks, so it has to do with the hair. Also by implication, a chaplet, there's the word again, especially of royalty, the consecration crown here, separation. Now the word chaplet, uh, you're not going to find that word by itself or definition for it directly in the lexicon or in the writings of the Bible. And I did look in the dictionary, and, and, the, word, and the word chaplet is defined as a wreath which is worn around the head. That's what um, my dictionary that I have available to me defines a chaplet as. Exodus chapter 29, verses 4 and 5. Exodus 29, verses 4 and 5. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle, the congregation shall wash them with water. And thou shalt take the garments and put upon Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastplate and gird him with the curious girdle of the ephod in verse 6. And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head and put the holy crown upon the mitre. So here we have two we have two things happening to the high priest. This is just that it just designated to the high priest is he's having being attired with his holy garments with a mitre on his head and then on top of the mitre there's uh, actually a holy crown put on his head. And, and if you read in the whole entire context of uh, Exodus 29 and pieces in the book of Leviticus is where they describe the um, manufacturing of these particular items. They tell you that the crown is made out of pure gold. All right, the word mitre is the Hebrews 47.01. Mitznefa. Mitznefeth. It's from Hebrews 68.01. It means a tiara. That is an official turban of a king or high priest, a diadem, a mitre. So we have this, it, it, it's basically a wrap, a head wrap, and we're familiar with it. You know, in the Middle Eastern uh, cultures, the men wear 
uh, most of them wear, especially in the Arabian cultures, wear this this type of head wrap. Um, and then around that, there would have been a, the, a wreath of gold. And I have a note here that when I do my studies, as I'm going through and, and things pop in my mind or uh, points of interest or points for me to remember, I'll just put them in brackets and, and write them down. But I do have a note here that says, that according to the details of John's vision, the apparel of the 20, the apparel of what they were wearing of the 24 elders did not include the mitre that, according to the Torah, was placed directly atop the head of the high priest only, so that would exclude them from being of the line. Now, let me put this. It, it, to me, it wouldn't put them in the line of the high priesthood, saying so. Because you're going to find out that the uh, the pre-tribulation rapture theory, the, the, they uh, contend that the 24 elders are representative of the 24 courses of the Levitical priesthood, not necessarily the high priest. So that's why I included that note in there, that it's that there was, according to John's vision, there was no uh, mitre upon the heads of these any elders. All right, uh, Book of Psalms, chapter 89, verse 39. Thou hast made void the covenant of thy servant. Thou hast profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. When you go back and read the whole account in Psalms 89, um, the servant that they're talking about here is, is King David. And it's talking about, it, it's giving reference to those that came after him, how they made the covenant void that the Most High made, but David, that his seed would never depart from the throne. Um, they made void, and the crown or the, the designation that he was the ruler of Israel um, was basically cast to the ground. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 16. And Yahweh their Elohim shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as, as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon his land. Now we're going to uh, take a look at the word diadem, and we that was in one of the definitions. It was actually in the definition of the mitre, which is was the wrap upon the high priest's head. Well, we're going to look into a few scriptures that actually talk about the the word diadem. All right, the word diadem is the Hebrew 6843. It's pronounced sephirah in the Hebrew. It means a crown as encircling the head. There we go again with the, the, with the, um, the chaplet or the, the wreath. Also a term of affairs that is mishap, diadem, mourning. Ezekiel 21, 25, and 26. And thou profane wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come when the Nicky shall have an end, thus saith Yahweh the Elohim, remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. Now, it is rather remarkable now that as we understand Ezekiel 25 and 26, these items, these these head, this head attire also was used on the kings, the line of the Israelite kings, or as it refers to here as princes, which is also rulers. And so we know now that it wasn't only specifically for the high priesthood, or for the high priest more specifically in Israel, it was also worn by the line of kings. The word crowns we find in the New Testament is used only in a couple of different forms and present meanings that relate to a type of recognition of position, as it has to do with nobility and also one which translates that of those which are overcomers. The crown of the overcomers is described as a crown of life, a crown of glory, a crown of righteousness, and an incorruptible crown just to mention a few. The first of the two will we will address is the word crown as it was used in describing the attire or what they were wearing of the 24 elders. Here it's the word crown. It's the Greek 4735. Stephanos from an apparently primary st stepho to twine or wreath. A chaplet, there's the word chaplet again, as a badge of royalty a prize in the public games or a symbol of honor generally, but more conspicuous and elaborate than the simple fillet, uh, which is the Greek 1238, literally or figuratively, a crown. 
Now, fillet is a narrow band, a ribbon, put around the head to keep the hair in place or as an ornament. It is bind or decorate with a narrow band, ribbon, strip, etc. And this definition, I this is what I got out of, again, the dictionary. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 and 25. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Who are the they that Paul mentions here? Because he says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. It is they which have trusted in uncertain treasures of this earth and those which do not lay up for themselves treasures in heaven where nothing can corrupt them. So we have a an incorruptible crown because the saints that know to do well uh, send their treasures up into the heavens. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. This is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which Yahweh, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also unto them also that love is appearing. You know, this is not a crown as it relates to nobility, but rather a crown awarding for maintaining the righteousness that defines a true saint and an overcomer. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Messiah hath promised to them that love him. So here we have a crown of life. We just saw that Paul addressed it as a crown of righteousness. Here James is, is addressing it as a crown of life. You know, if you look behind the word life, it means to quick or to be quickened. This is another conveyance to those who obtain on the eternal life with Christ the King and not of those which are cast into hell, which is translated as eternal death. So we have a crown that gives us eternal life. 1 Peter 5, 4. And when the chief shepherd shall appear. Again, lining up with what Paul said, that he's going to receive a crown of righteousness on that day, at that day. Here Peter is saying that when the chief shepherd shall appear, it's at this time you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. There's an incorruptible crown again. Peter's just saying the same thing and reminding us about the same thing that Paul wrote. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. And, and these, remember, the 24 elders were all in John's vision as wearing crowns. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. So this gives you an idea of why they got the crowns, what, what kind of man or person they were, or people, uh, men that they were. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. There's the crown of life again. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. And uh, what, what, what John is writing here, or what the Messiah said to him, hold fast, and he that endureth to the end will not lose his crown. The other word for crown found in the New Testament, the Renewed Covenant writings, is the Greek 1238, and it's diadema. This is only found, used in three particular places, and it's all in the book of Revelation. But this form of the word crown denotes more of nobility, more of those that are in a place of rulership or uh, in, in position of judgment. Revelation 12, verse 3, Revelation 12, verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. Revelation chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. 
And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and righteous, that he does judge and make war. Of course, this is talking about Jesus, the lion, the lion of Judah. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And I believe there was probably so many crowns a man couldn't count them for every righteous virtue that ever existed. Hallelujah. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of Yah. Now I'm going to read to you an, an excerpt. This is an excerpt from an article that was published by another individual who did his own study concerning the 24 elders. And this was from a... I have his name in, the, in my reference notes down here. Um, I haven't got it before me. But I believe he was a pastor of a what they call a non-denominational church. And, you know, the reason I'm going to read this for you is because I believe this man did a very good job of relaying the understanding of the crowns worn by the 24 elders and those which will be worn by the saints that receive the prize. Okay, this is what he had to say. Fourthly, we believe that these elders are representatives of the church because they are seen wearing victors, wreaths of gold, or rewards achieved through faithful service. The translators of our English versions rendered the word Stephanoi by the word crowns. Our English word crown, however, translates two Greek words. The one is Stephanos, the other is diadema. A Stephanos was a wreath made of laurel, oak, leaves, ivy, parsley, myrtle, olive, violets, or roses. This was the crown that was given to the victor in the Greek athletic games. It's the, it was the crown that was given to the runner who first crossed the goal or hurled the discus the farthest or who pinned his opponent to the mat was awarded this wreath of victory. It was given to the servant of the state who was deserving of an honor. It was worn at marriage feast. Thus, a stenophos was a symbol of victory or deserved honor and festal gladness. And um, just backing up for a second, when the word crown is attached to the 24 elders, that's from the same Greek word, Stephanos. So here he's saying that it's a symbol of victory, of deserved honor, and of festal gladness. The basic meaning of this word then seems to mean a victor's wreath or a crown which had been worn in conflict. In other words, they earned it. The other word translated crown in our English versions is the word diadema. It occurs but three times in the New Testament and all three times in the book of Revelation. This is the word from which we get our word diadem. It, its root is the verb diadeo, meaning to bind around. It referred to a blue band of ribbon marked with white which the Persian kings used to bind on a turban or a tiara. It was a kingly ornament for the head and was a symbol of royalty. Hence, Stephanophos is a victor's crown and, and, and diadema is a royal crown. In the New Testament, this distinction seems to be carefully maintained. The rewards of believers are always spoken of as Stephanoi, and the crown of royalty is always a diadema. That this distinction is carefully maintained, at least in the New Testament, is pointed out by, and he references Trench, whoever Trench is. We must not confuse these words because our English crown stands for both of them. I greatly doubt whether anywhere in the classic lit classical literature, Stephanos is used for the kingly or imperial crown. In the New Testament, it is plain that the Stephanos, whereof St. Paul speaks, is always the conquerors and not the kings. And he gives reference to 1 Corinthians 9, chapters, verses 24 through 26, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. The only occasion on which Stephanos might seem to be used of kingly crown is Matthew chapter 27 verse 29 Mark 15 verse 17 and John chapter 19 verse 2 even Robertson and Vincent in their word studies though doubting whether this careful distinction continued into later Greek admit that the apostle John uses the word diadema consistently of kingly crowns and maintains such distinctions aren't and Gingrich, whose work is the latest in the field of Greek and English lexicon, gave, gave support to the idea that such a distinction was made between these two words. Stephanos is the victor's crown, and Diadema is the royal crown. In light of these facts, observe that the elders of Revelation 4.4 4 are wearing Stephanoi, not Diademata. They are wearing victor's crowns, which have been worn in conflict. 
Only the redeemed are promised such crowns. All right, brothers and sisters, I'm going to cut it off here for this part of the study. I know we went over our hour's time limit a little bit, but hallelujah. And as this unfolds, um, I think you're going to be surprised at, at some of the um, the uh, things that are actually contained in the writings that we may have never considered. Um, and But more importantly, again, the reminder of why I'm doing the study is because the pre-tribulationist rapture people use this as one of their uh, concrete cornerstones, if I can use the term, as the reason why the saints are raptured out of here before the start of the Great Tribulation. And we will show you even contained in the Bible that they fail to actually read things in context because if they actually bothered to consider the whole vision that John was doing, they would find out that the words would be in error. And, and, and they are in error. So anyway, I sure hope you enjoyed this part of this um, presentation. And again, we're going to continue on all the attributes that were labeled, as John saw in his vision, to the 24 elders. We, we went through the, the crown that they were wearing tonight and the white garment they had on, the significance behind that. Until then, um, bless you all. I pray that your week be filled with peace and that, uh, of course, as I always do, and, uh, and, and again, I can't stress it enough, please uh, keep diligent in your prayers for Pastor Dow for his strength and for his peace and that though his burdens be upon him, they be light. Um, I also that you would ask him to continue to pray for us here at the ministry. Uh, and we do thank you for that and blessings. Shalom, Israel. Uh-oh, look at him looking.